transformation of arm Jim Nielsen, N-I-E-L-S-E-N, Commissioner, Board of Prison Terms. Carol Bentley, B-E-N-T-L-E-Y, Commissioner, Board of Prison Terms. Manny Guadarrama, G-U-A-D-E-R-R-A-M-A, Commissioner, Board of Prison Terms. Stephen K, Deputy District Attorney, Los Angeles County, K-A-Y. Patricia Tate, T-A-T-E, next to Ken, Victims. Out over here. Peter Nang. Spell last name. N-E-Y. And your function. Uh, I can't remember. Okay. Uh, Paul Veronese. That's Paul. V E R O N E Z Z I. Son of Ray. Steve Fournier, F O U R N I E. Victim Services. Linda Deutsch, D E U T S C H. Report of Associated Press. Doug Brockner, B R U C K N E R. Television Reporter. Officer Sloan, S L O A N. Correctional Officer. Okay, thank you very much. Sorry. Linda. Frazier, F-R-A-S-C-R, attorney for the inmate, Susan Atkins. Susan Atkins, A-T-K-I-N-S, W-0-8-3-0-4, prison. Okay, the purpose of today's hearing is again to consider your suitability for parole. In arriving at a decision, we will consider the commitment offenses, your prior criminal and social history, as well as your behavior and overall programming since your commitment. We reviewed your files and prior transcripts, and you have an opportunity to make corrections and clarifications as we go. Any time during the proceedings you have any questions about anything that's going on, don't hesitate to stop us, and we'll, we'll try to answer your questions. Mm -hmm. The way this hearing will be conducted today, I will be discussing with you the life offense, your prior criminal and uh, social history, and then we will go to Ms. Bentley in my immediate right, and she'll discuss with you post-conviction factors, not your adjustment institution, but particularly since your last hearing. 
Then we will go to Mr. Nielsen, the far right, and he'll discuss the parole plans. Following that, I'll pull the panel and see if they have any questions. Uh, then I'll ask Mr. Kay, representing the uh, people of Los Angeles County, uh, if he has any questions, he'll direct those questions through the chair. And if you uh, desire to respond to those questions, you respond back to me. Yes, sir. Following that, uh, your attorney will have an opportunity to ask you questions directly. Uh, when we get done with the questioning phase, we'll go back to Mr. K, and I'll ask him to uh, make comments concerning your suitability for parole. Then your attorney will have an opportunity to make a statement. And if you want to address the panel, you can do so following your attorney. Uh, we also have a next of kin here today. Uh, the sister of uh, Miss Tate, and she'll have an opportunity to make a statement. Uh, if she uh, decides to make the statement, she'll be the last one to speak today. Then we'll recess, uh, we'll clear the room, the panel will stay here, we'll discuss your case, and when we reach a decision, we'll call you back. Okay, okay you are afforded uh, certain rights to timely notice, availability of files for review, and a right to present relevant documents, and I'll ask your attorney if she's satisfied that your rights have been met up to now. Up to this point. You also have a right to impartial panel. Do you have any objections to any of the panel members you see before you? No, sir, I do not. Okay. Today you'll receive a copy of the, uh, the tentative written decision. The decision becomes final in 60 days after it's gone to, to uh, Sacramento for uh, review. A transcript and a copy of the decision will automatically be sent to you and you have a right to appeal for 90 days if you're dissatisfied with the results of today's hearing. Today, you're not required to discuss the life offense of the panel, you're not required to admit your guilt, but the panel does hold as true the, the findings of the court. You came in here convicted of murder, and you're going to leave this room convicted of murder. Our charge here today is to determine whether you're suitable for parole or not. I have a documents list here I'd like uh, Ms. Fraser and Mr. K to take a look at, make sure all parties have the same documents. That's exhibit number one. Satisfied, you have all the reports? Yes, I have all the reports. You're satisfied too? Thank you. Okay, do you have any objections? Yes, I have uh, just a few objections um, that I'd like to take primarily for the record. Uh, the first objective I, ha I have would be the presence of what I consider to be an illegitimate news show, namely hard copy um, as covering this. Um, I consider them to amount to the National Enquirer covering this. Um, the second objection that I have... Let me go that one first. Okay. Uh, they've cleared uh, their presence here through the uh, proper channels, and they are authorized, and they have constitutional right to be here. I will note that for the record. Okay. Thank you. Um, the second thing that I will object to is um, the introduction of any letters that have been solicited um, by any party through the National Choir, the Globe, or the Star. I see that as designed to incite the public in my client's case and to essentially undermine the integrity of this board in considering my client's suitability for parole in terms of bias. So to that end, I will object to any introduction of letters. Further, I have not seen or reviewed any of those letters, and so uh, before any of them will be introduced, I will request that we have an opportunity to review them. Here's what we're all in the same boat. I haven't seen any of those letters either. So to my knowledge, no, they are not in our possession, so they will not be used. Thank you. I appreciate that. No, we don't plan on uh, bringing them here today. They apply to all five defendants, and they will be at a later time brought to Sacramento and delivered to the headquarters of the uh, Board of Prison Terms. That's fine. Thank you. Um, I'm going to request from this board that we limit Mr. K's statement to the facts of this case as presented at the trial that my client was involved in, and not the facts from any other trial from any other co-defendant in this case. Okay, he'll uh, uh, hopefully be following the materials that we have here today, and uh, anything that hasn't been submitted already uh, will not be considered. Oh, thank you. Uh, um, and last but not least, I would ask that this board not to consider any cri um, pictures of the crime scene or pictures of the victims that have not been sent to us prior to that. Um, I, enough of it has really been said about this case, and I don't wish to have this board's integrity undermined by inflaming. I did not see any uh, photographs in the uh, C file, and to my knowledge, uh, we don't have any in our position. Okay. We're, we're not planning on submitting any. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Is your client going to be responding to our questions today? Yes. Okay, would you raise your right hand and I'll swear you in? 
Do you solemnly swear or affirm a testimony you give before this panel be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir, I do. Thank you. Okay, what I'm going to do, I'm going to read the statement of facts uh, from the, the hearing held on July 6, 1979. And that was at your, I believe, your initial hearing. Mr. Carvalho, before you proceed, May I have a glass of water? Certainly. Thank you. Officer, could you get two glasses of water for the prison? Referring to case number A267861 on July 25th, 1969, the prisoner and crime partner, uh, Robert Kenneth Beausoleil. Beausoleil, Charles Manson, Bruce Davis, and Mary Bruner together and separately went to the home of the victim, Gary Hinman, to solicit money from him. The victim apparently failed to satisfy the request. He was kept prisoner for a period of time, cut and stabbed repeatedly. The cause of death was ascribed to a stab wound in the heart. The body was discovered on July 31st, 1969. Under case number A253156, referring to counts one through five, these concern the murders which occurred on August 9, 1969 at the Polanski residence located, located at 10050 Cello Drive, Los Angeles. As to count one, Abigail Ann Folger died from multiple stab wounds of the body. Count two, the victim, Frykowski, uh, death was caused by a gunshot wound of the left back and multiple blunt force trauma to the head. He was also stabbed. As to count three, the victim, Stephen Earl Parent, death was caused by multiple gunshot wounds. Count four, Sharon Marie Polanski, cause of death was multiple stab wounds of the body. And the victim in count five, Jay Sebring, cause of death was multiple stab wounds. As to count six and seven, of Lino LaBianca and his wife, Rosemary. These killings took place on August 10th, 1969 at their residence located at 3301 Waverly Drive, Los Angeles. Lino LaBianca's death was ascribed to multiple stab wounds to the neck and abdomen. Uh, this refers to count six, count seven, Rosemary LaBianca, whose death that was ascribed to multiple stab wounds to the neck and trunk. Count eight, conspiracy to commit murder refers to the prisoners, to the prisoner, and crime partners conspiring to kill the victims in the first seven counts. Uh, this has gone over, been gone over a number of times. You've had a number of hearings here. Uh, is there anything that you'd like to say about your involvement uh, in these murders yes. for your base hearing? Yes. Um, I've attempted on numerous occasions um, at these hearings to explain my involvement. At my last hearing, I asked the panel members to please understand that my statements are in no way an excuse. I am not trying to excuse my participation. They are not, um, uh, there's no, absolutely no justification. There is no way that I can justify my participation or excuse it. So I preface my statements with that and ask that you keep that in mind. Um, I would also like to state that it is almost impossible to explain to competent, intelligent people that occurred um, 23 years ago from a now cognizant, aware, conscious position. And I ask that as I state what happened, you keep in mind that it is almost impossible to understand insanity from a sane point of view. And that's what I was living on, was insanity. Um, I had, through my own actions, been involved in drug abuse um, for approximately a year to two years prior to my having met Charles Manson. Um, I got involved in 
drug use and drug abuse, I think, as a product of being um, just young with no direction. I had left home at 18. I, uh, I'm not sure whether the panel members are aware or not, but I came from a very, very dysfunctional family. Again, it's not an excuse. It, they are just statements of fact. Um, I came from a dysfunctional family of two alcoholic parents. I suffered um, sexual, sexual molestation as a young child from a family member and from people surrounding my family. When I left home at 18, I was extremely angry, um, extremely vulnerable, um, directionless, and couple that with my own involvement in drug abuse and my own need to be loved and accepted from almost at any cost at that point in time, I became very, very susceptible to the times. And I ask that the panel members take into consideration the times, not as an excuse. That